Okay, namaste and welcome to the session number 18. And that happens to be concluding the current course on Dhyan and Upasana as described by Rishis in Sankh and Yoga and their predecessors. So as we have seen two weeks ago, this course is very simple enough from the practice point of view. If somebody wants to assimilate the practice methods in day-to-day -day life. However, theory is uh, not that simple. Originally, it must have been very simple. But now that there are a number of misconceptions, I can visualize for a course participant to find it rather difficult or complex. So today, that's what we stated two weeks ago, the course is authentic, comprehensive, and simplest. Today we want to look at a few features that can characterize this present course as an authentic. Okay, so this we have seen, this has been quoted by Vyas in Yoga 3.6. Yogen Yogo Jyatavyo, Yogo Yogat Pavaitate, Yo Apamatastu, Yogen Sa Yoga Ramate Chayam. So, of course, the slide begins with to succeed in Upasana, one need not be a scholar in the theory of Upasana, because that is. That is so, that's what is the natural beauty of Vipassana. Just like, and we have provided with this analogy that every child is able to be with his mother <clears throat> and nobody has to teach that. In the same manner, every human being can be with their supreme mother, father, or their supreme consciousness, whichever way you look at. What this particular verse is saying, practicing yoga, one learns the related knowledge. Yogen yogo jyatabhu. So I have been emphasizing it many times that learning of these principles will be facilitated if you are practicing this in your day-to-day -day life. So as you practice, you get better and deeper insights. Okay. I just want to give you an overview. The way I look at Upasana or Upasana Yoga as the faculty of knowledge and how the related literature has brought the knowledge to us. So, of course, the that's what I say, unfolding of its theoretical foundation. I'm not saying evolution of its foundation, nor I am saying its devolution. It is simply that a new and new body of knowledge in the form of books has appeared. And there is a good reason why that must have appeared at that point of time. So of course, things begins from the Vedas, where all sorts of issues are covered including Upasana Yoga, but I am not saying any deficiency in the Vedas, but in the age, which I can call as Vedic age, it just turned out that people, all people were in the first category. So I hope you are able to recall three categories of human beings. And uh, I gave uh, you an analogy of mother and child to be able to see that this is in real time. Any community has these three categories of human beings. And that's what makes human beings apart from all other billions of species. That even if I know my dharma, I can deviate from it. No other thing in the world, in the universe, can deviate from its dharma. But we human beings, 
it is not that we don't have a dharma because that supreme designer has allotted certain dharma to everything in the universe. So we also have a dharma. We can call it as human dharma, manav dharma, whatever it is. But we have a luxury, we have the freedom that even if I know my dharma, I can deviate from it and do something what is other. So that's what makes these three categories. From the lowest bound, I will say the category number three, one who is willing to go in the direction of other, what is non dharma Category two, always goes in the direction of dharma because this is good for his own well-being. Now category one is very unusual. They always go in the direction of dharma, but in a very natural manner. Not that it will bring some rewards to them. So that is what is the concept of nishkam karma. So in the Vedic case, all people were in the first category of people and they were filled with love towards Ishwar. So now when we say yoga, union, my union with that supreme consciousness, we have to go through a number of elaborate procedures because our love to that entity is not pure, not genuine, and not to the fullest extent. And that's what we get to know when we close our eyes because all other chitravittis are coming. That means I love that more than loving that issue, is it not? If your love for Ishwa is, is to the final highest category, highest level, then no other Chitvetri should be bombarding you, is it not? So that's what I mean by all people were filled with love towards Ishwa. So it was very simple, just like it is very simple for a child to be with his mother. So was it so in the case of early days. Then came a time that there were tendencies that that love was slightly diminishing. Now, then came a body of literature called Upanishads, reminding people that this is in your own interest to be filled with that love towards Ishwar. So Upanishads are same as Vedas, but Vedas are filled with all faculty, all kinds of knowledge, but Upanishads are primarily focused on the knowledge of Upasana. So Upanishads is mostly on Upasana. Now comes a time, that's where Kapil must have come and felt the need to write Sankhya. So this is a, this was Vedic age, this is Upanishadic age, now here comes the age of what we call Shardarshan. It begins with Sankhya first. Now in the time of Kapil, of course the large majority is in the first category, but some begin to move into the second one that we say as a worldly human being, Sansayik people. Sansayik person is one who goes, who follows the Dharma, but because this is a good business strategy to get, to get a life full of joy, pleasure, and happiness. So he follows dharma, not by his own intrinsic, unconditional reasoning. He does it by way of, as a policy matter. So some people begin to move into the second category, and then Kapil is warning them, that your life will encounter miseries because howsoever smart you are, some sort of pain will strike you and that will make your life painful. So he is suggesting to develop that bonding with Ishwa and we continue to remain in the first category of us. Now times are changing again. Now that Patanjali comes in the picture, large majority in the first and second categories. But some even begin to move into the third category. 
where for quick personal gains, they are willing to harm others. That is what is adharm. So they have a, they are thinking they are smart people. They can cheat others or harm others and at the expense of others, they can make their life more enjoyable. So he writes in his book, because he wants to do good to all the humanity, he has three kinds of prescriptions. So this is for the first time that prescription of yoga is becoming, is expanding because the people are of different kinds. So his three prescriptions are yoga, kriya yoga and ashtang yoga. Now in his terminology, he is not saying that directly, he is not saying it directly that the people are having different kinds of karma. Sorry. He is saying people are having a parameter because when we come into the world, we come into the world because there is an element that is called clash. So we have gone to a sufficient extent what this term clash is. This is what caused me to take birth in this world. So in other words, this is what is an hindrance to mukti. So as long as there is clash, I am not mukta. So clash can be seen as an obstacle, a hindrance to being a real, free, isolated cavalier, you know what is called. So clash is that kind of a technical term. And the way he interprets the three categories of people, first category has very tiny clash. Second has significant clash, but they are still on the But third category, clash has been dominating to such an extent that it has deposited impurities in the powerful tool that we have, our buddhi intellect. So our buddhi has become contaminated by excessive overpowered clash. That is what has been driving our mind. So this is his way of looking at three categories of people. And then he gives us three prescriptions. Yoga in chapter one, Samadhi Path. Kriya Yoga in chapter two, first section, which is called uh, Sadhan Path. Chapter two is Sadhan Path. And his first part is Kriya Yoga. And second chapter, second part begins with Ashtang Yoga. That goes on until the end of the third chapter. Fourth chapter is describing the philosophy of what is Kavali. So that is called Kavali path. So this is the structure of his book. And that's how right from the early age, Rishis have brought us this knowledge so that we understand it. Of course, there is no need to add anything further because there will never be a fourth category of human being. So Patanjali Yoga will always remain as the final treatise on this faculty of knowledge called Yoga. We call it Upasana Yoga nowadays because by term Yoga, a general mass population take it as Hut Yoga. So we want to be clear that we are not talking about Hut Yoga we are talking about the true yoga, that is Upasana yoga. The term yoga means union, and that's what it leads to, my union with that Supreme Consciousness. But yet, it is a very significant part. About 140, 50 years ago, my Shidhanand, he did not write an exclusive book on yoga, but in his one book called Higvedadi Bhashibhumika, that is his introduction to the commentaries on the Vedas. So he wrote a commentaries on the Vedas and that was prefaced by a comment, by an introduction. That introduction itself is so huge, it has become a separate book by itself. In that book, 
he devotes one chapter on upasana so that is the only place where he could share his ideas of upasana and he makes one very significant contribution there talking about he is just talking he is talking nothing new he is just this kind of exposition of ashtang view but as you know first five elements are called as bahyang yoga outer yoga namely yam niyama asan pranayam pratyaha now the later three third are dhyan and samadhi they are in a yoga they are actual yoga so to say others are prepared you that's why they are just you know they are not mandatory they are if you wish you can follow them in order to do the later part better so here as he moves to dharana he makes a very significant contribution he says that because in patanjali ashtang yoga dharana is you can pick up any chitta vritti of your choice and concentrate on it now dhyanand suggests that your chitta vritti that you are choosing should be pranav jap the citation of the sound having taken that what it happens naturally is as you move on from dharana to dhyan to samadhi you are of your own whether you realize it or not you move on from ashtang yoga to kriya yoga to yoga so you are you are progressing from category 3 to 1 to 2 category 2 to category 1 and within category 1 because a citation of pranav is what is called ishwar pranidhan it takes you to the finality so that is a very significant contribution that we have benefited in this present course as i am winding up i devote two slides to sushupti and samadhi what are the similarities and differences because this statement of sankhya in chapter 5 that i have shown you previously also samadhi sushupti mokshesu bhamrupta kapil has brought three states of ours at par as if we are in the lap of that ishwar and why is he using the term bhamm and not ishwar probably i have indicated in the early part when bhamm is in interaction with matter that is called ishwar so what he is trying to say in these three states i am not with ishwar rather i am with bhamm or what the anand would say parmeshwar so that is a philosophical a subtle difference i probably might have explained it is like a child approaching his mother but say the mother is busy in the kitchen but still she holds the child this is case number 1 case number 2 is he approaches his mother when the mother is relaxing he is not busy with anything now in case number 2 he gets 100% attention of his mother while in case number 1 he was getting part attention because she was busy working in the kitchen now the same thing is ishwar is like mother in the kitchen and bam is mother relaxing is totally available to the fullest extent so that much so, so much about bhamm and ishwar or parmeshwar and ishwar let's look at this sushupti and samadhi because in our practice method our top line has been that our attempt should be to bring our mind overall mind aggregate mind as if it prevails in sushupti which every human being is familiar with every no not that all human beings are familiar with samadhi so you cannot explain to them what is samadhi but if you talk to them in terms of sushupti they can understand what is it so sushupti is a state of mind no dreams nothing is happening in your mind 
It is absolutely blank, no perturbations at all. It is still, that still blank mind is called Susupti and that's what we desire in our sitting posture to be in Samadhi. <coughs> so let's look at on the left column, left side, item one, as if a child, of course, these are analogies, so like an adult human being, is not interested in approaching his mother. Mother is an analogy for Ishwar. But she likes to hold the child in sleep. One obtains as default. So Sushupti is every human being has obtained as a default state. We have obtained it. What was happening? It is as if you imagine a child, you know, it is something comes to us as default that I now want to, you to visualize a child. Difficult to visualize. I don't think any child exists in the world like this, but this can be visualized. A child who is not interested in being with his mother in the daytime, who just plays around here and there. He doesn't like it. It's an abnormal child, of course, is it not? But we can visualize. But the mother is always interested in being with the child, is it not? She loves the child. The child may not be reciprocating love to his mother to the desirable extent, but the mother's love is there. So what does that mother do? She is of course longing that the child should come to me in the daytime get away from his friends and his books and toys, etc. and come to me, be with me intimately for a few minutes, but the child is not doing so. But mother does something, of course, nobody can stop her. When the child is asleep, she comes and holds the child, isn't it? So imagine, Shushupti is like this, that as a human being, I am not interested in being with that supreme being, but she takes me to that sleep where I am in her lap. I may not be aware of it. And I never cared to go to her in the daytime, but certain nights, she, I am in her lap, whether I know it or not. But if I continue to be adamant, if I continue to disregard her, then as an adult, I come to a point that item two, even Shushupti may slip away, that was once in easy reach. So as I was, as I am aging, with age what is happening, my sleep is less likely to be Shushupti. It came to me as default, but I didn't, you know, the exact, the real objective of human life is to progress from Shushupti to Samadhi. If I just don't care, then what happens? Then even this Shushupti slips away, is it not? That's what we are listing in the left side. Now Samadhi is corresponding to, as if a child is approaches his, is approaches his mother in the daytime, out of love that he has to. That's what we talked about, Vedic age of nation. When human being had genuine love towards that supreme being, is it not? And that even any time, in any age, every child will have natural love towards his mother, has it, is it not? And uh, as an adult, if I reciprocate, that same love to that supreme being, then I am Samadhi. So the love that mother has to me, and if I begin to reciprocate that, then I will march on from Sushupti to Samadhi. And of course, as I am progressing in Samadhi, she will always continue to be taking me to Sushupti. So Sushupti will always stay there. So this is a good barometer for you if you are progressing in your life with Upasana. If you are, if your sleep 
is getting more often you get into sushupti then it is a good indicator that your practice of upasana is also going in the right direction and if you have genuine love for ishwar sushupti of course stays in easy reach let's look at it in a slightly philosophical framework what is sushupti and samadhi because we as individual purush we are a point like singularity like in a geometry graph paper i take a pointed pencil and i mark the location of a point that point is supposed to have no length no width nothing it just has one parameter its location in the same manner this is my atma tattva my purush but there are two more entities that are also eternal the matter called as prakriti and ishwar called as ishwar or bam when it is not engaged with matter whatever it is they are two continua two coexisting continua prakriti and ishwar and i am a point of course you can visualize i am no go i am either in the ocean of prakriti or in the ocean of vishwa there is no other third possibility isn't it so when i am immersed in the ocean of prakriti i am in sushupti so that's what it says immersed in prakriti and prakriti when it's very original form is called as padham just like ishwa when it is not in interaction with matter is called as parameshwa or ishwa or bam while bam or parameshwa interacting with matter is called ishwa in the same manner matter untouched by ishwa is called as padham otherwise it is called as paket okay but these are kind of synonyms so he is immersed in paketi but i wrote padhan because paketi is things are evolving out of padhan but padhan is sattva rajas tamas samya avastha paketi when sattva rajas and tamas are in equilibrium there is no fluctuation since there is no fluctuation there is no dukha so that is why sushupti is so good because there is no fluctuation in these three gunas of sattva rajas and tamas it's all in equilibrium equipoise but i am taken there by ishwar carried by ishwar but unaware of him he took me to that ocean otherwise when we are not in sushupti we have dreams or like in the day time we are functioning then that tiny point like purush is always connected to the mind in particular to the buddhi or chitta what we call so he is always watching this even as we go to sleep in dreams but why sushupti is so wonderful because now there is a blackout somebody does it and makes this absolute black dark there is nothing to be seen in other words i am immersed in the prakriti ocean of prakriti no fluctuations nothing is happening that is called sushupti but i don't go, go there at my will i don't go there of my own still it is granted by ishwar is it not when you go to bed in the evening like late night late evening you don't say that i want to be in sushupti tonight sometimes you have it sometimes you don't have it it is not you to decide it is you are blessed by him when you get sushupti and that as i said in the previous slide 
that is an indicator you will make some progress in samadhi also. But now, of course, this is Brahma Upta. That's why Kapil is calling, because it is his blessing. He is taking it there. Whereas in Samadhi, you are immersed in the other ocean. Other ocean is Ishwas, who is Satchidananda Swarup. So we have identified Ananda Swarup. Dhyana never has Ishwas Ananda, he has Parmeshwas Ananda Swarup. But I didn't want to confuse another term. Technically, philosophically, it has to be Parmeshwar Ananda It has to be Bhamrupta. It is not Ishwar. But let's not get into that semantics at this point of time. But carried by Ishwar, and here I am aware of being with him. In Shushukti, I am unaware of anything, not even about my own self. It's just this total darkness out of the world, nowhere, nothing is happening. As far as I am concerned, everything, the world, universe is frozen. Nothing is happening. Even time is frozen. Timelessness. Of course, that is here also, timelessness. But here there is self-awareness. And important distinction in the second item. Your personality remains the same as you entered into Sushupti and when you come out of it, the content of your Ahankar unit is same, does not undergo any change. But yes, you are refreshed, both in body and mind. You are very refreshed. Sushupti is very good that way. But Samadhi is one notch above Sushupti. Your personality undergoes transformation. The content of ahankar, the clutter, the un, undesirable thing is taken away and maybe some good seeds are planted. So that's what this Yajurveda mantra is. Vishwani Dev Savita Duitani Payasu Yad Bhaddam Tannas All the undesirables may vanish, may wash turn. That's what he does it, provided you are in his lap. So this is why Upasana is so important for any individual's personality development, quality of life, and making life more purposeful, enjoyable, worth, and so on and so forth. I have shown many times prominent features of this present course. Don't take it as any other course on Sangha Yoga, or meditation, so many things are happening in the world. This is something very special. Because it is for the first time after the death of my Shitaya, about 140 years, it is first time it is happening. As I said, he did not write an exclusive book on Upasana, but he wrote a few words here and there. But in the last 140 years, nobody could decode them. It is the first time we know what chit is. You will be surprised. In these 140 years, so many books must have been written on song and you, but nobody got the correct meaning of chit. We understood what the Anand is saying. From Nigantu 3.9, that is the highest authority on the words appearing in the Vedas. Yasmin Chittam Sarva Motam Prajanam Tanme Mana. We have seen this. Fifth mantra, 34th chapter, Yaju. What is Chitt? Even now, today, I will say, I haven't seen a book who, know, who that explains Chitt correctly. That is the first stand. It's like four pillars I am describing that holds this course. Otherwise, there are many minor things here and there. Four foundations, pillars. Chit, 
and now we know it, it is same as buddhi, but when buddhi is not doing its potential, that is adhivasai. What is adhivasai? Discriminative process. To reach a conclusion about incoming knowledge or outgoing action, decision making. That is what buddhi does. When buddhi is not engaged in this function, then that instrument in its state of latent state of lower potential is called chitta. And when that also vanishes, chitta vetti has been attained. Patanjali did not say buddhi vetti Buddhi vetti is very easy. You close your eyes and stop thinking. But even when you stop thinking, all sorts of chitta are arising, like in dreams. Dreams, you are not thinking, but there is a procession of one vetti after another. You are helplessly watching. So you may do day daydreaming and keep your eyes closed. You are not thinking not planning anything. But buddhi vetti niyod is first necessary condition. Then it is chitta vetti That's what I have been speaking. From patyaha to dhana is a dual jump. From mano my course to vijyan my course. And within vijyan my course from buddhi to chitta now. So people don't know what chitta. And I will be I just opened it out, not criticizing anybody. I just want to show you how things have gone wrong. This is Patanjali Yoga Sutra by Swami Vivekananda, a celebrated personality. Yoga 1.2, Yoga Chitvetti Nayodha. Look at his next. He is writing Chitta. For what reason I never understand. Why did he have to write Manas, Buddhi and Ankar? There was no reason. That is in Sankhya. But he writes the organs in the earth, Manas, determinative faculty, Buddhi, that is correct. And Ankar, again, he is wrong, which I don't, which is not the point I want to show at this point. But he is saying the three components of mind, buddhi, ahankara, and manas. And then he says, there are but various processes in the mind stuff called chitta. So chitta, in his view, is aggregate of buddhi, ahankara, and manas. Acharji, that slide is not uh, on the screen. Oh, I am sorry. Yeah. Oh. I shared a slide, but I did not. I actually didn't share properly. <laughs> okay. So let me go back. This is a book. It's Patanjali Yoga Sutras by a very celebrated author, Swami Vivekananda. He's a very well known personality. And I am showing to you his remarks he is making on Yoga Darshan 1.2, that is Yoga Chitta Vetti Nayoda. And Chitta is acting as mind stuff. Is it not? They aggregate mind as a whole, not what we have learned in the course. Buddhi in a very subtle state is called chitta. And that the evidence we have from Nigantu. Nigantu 3.9. Now I'm showing you, this is, he has done a great work on Patanjali Yoga Sutta as well as Vyas commentaries, translating from English, from Sanskrit to English. Professor Woods of Harvard University probably 1918, early 1914. 
ಪತಂಜಲಿ ಯೋಗ you don't have to but he somehow being sit there and he translated as egoism and that has been the translation by all the people in last 140 years and what have we seen we have seen it as storehouse of the impatience of the past knowledge experience kind that is what push does Purush is every time engaged in Jyan, Karam and Bhog. And what has happened in the past, it, is, it has to be stored somewhere. And obviously that's what is stored in Aankar. But that has not been picked up correctly. And here also we have taken it from Yajurveda and also from Vyas Kamenti, from Sankhikaika, Ishwa Krishna. in the year 385 or so he knew it that anka is the storehouse of the sanskars this has been missed out this is where all the chitvetis are coming from anka is sending the on the intellect which is being called a chit here in the when i am practicing for meditation so when it comes to chitta vritti niyod i have to know what is chitta is and i have to know where the chitta vrittis are coming from if i don't know it oh. how can i form it and flow chart of yoga sutra in no oh. book in the world i have seen that has appreciated that patanjali is writing three prescriptions for three kinds of people they just use here and there and of course contribution of my sidan that ashtang yog becomes good for all one does not have to worry about what category i am so uh, so we are ready to go to the world and tell them that patanjali yog can be now properly interpreted is it not so i am concluding now science and religion in the age of science and future of science what is science cause and effect relationship and that relationships can be proved because it is evidence based verifiable validated and that's what patanjali yoga is also you can go through implement all his prescriptions and see for yourself who you are is it not and what are religions they are faith based that's why there is an as here multiplicity and as we see they are for last 2000 years or more cause of conflicts and wars we are fortunate to live in the present age of science but religions continue to exist so there is a misnomer we say we are living in the age of science but there are a lot of faith based ideas that are floating around why because science fails to deliver something that everyone seeks like every child wants to be naturally with his mother 
if you don't give a prescription how a human being can be with their supreme being, there will always be a vacuum in everybody's life. And if science doesn't give them direction, they will go to the religions. So religions will continue to exist. And we may even say it is age of science. Of course, people say it nicely that all religions are good. They are different paths to one God. That's what people, that's what we hear. But I think as you practice Upasana, you will say, all religions take us away from God, is it not? All religions take us away from Yeshua. So that will be the state of affair unless something is done. We will continue to call it age of science. We live in, but there will be continuous conflicts and wars. So science with Upasana as discussed and practiced here can bring universal and lasting peace in the world. Because with Upasana, every individual will have a balanced personality. And then the humanity as a whole will be on a stronger ground. So what are we saying? Modern scientists must explore the twofold, two fundamental entities, matter and consciousness. They are two fundamental entities. Otherwise, the today's mainstream science says that my brain functions give rise to the outcome of mind and consciousness. We are saying within the brain there is a tiny cave where resides that push and that is consciousness. So they have to do, they have to do the experiment. So we have to get some scientists get interested in the two Upasana Yoga and when they sit, otherwise today they experiment upon another meditation practice and they conclude Upasana Samadhi is same as Sushupti because yes, brain functions are same in Sushupti and Samadhi. But when they do the experiment on themselves, they go through the Upasana, they go to Samadhi then they won't say Samadhi and Shushupti are the same. Then they will know who am I, that Purush, is it not? So, we hope we are on a very strong footing. Now we can present Upasana Yoga in a very rigorous manner to anybody who is interested in learning. Today, as I said, you know, I want to include what is generally called as Vedic Sandhya. Some of you are aware of it and how it has also devolved, unfortunately. Sandhya was Sandhyopasana, but now it has become mere recitation of the mantras. Slightly short of time, but I will like to close it with Vedic Sandhya done as Sandhyopasana. It's just a citation of certain mantras. We will take it from, I, I like a particular website. Where is it, I thought? Yeah, it's just one minute. Okay. <clears throat> Some of you know all these mantras, but we'll go through them and I will keep moving my cursor so you are okay with it. And it culminates with Gaiti Mantra. And there we will do what we really do as Upasana. Not long, maybe just five minutes because 
this excitation will absorb about 15 to 20 minutes. So I'm trying to balance as much as possible. So I'm not putting my timer now, but I'm just setting it for five minutes. I will press the button only when we get to it. Okay, so. <clears throat> Om Shanno Devi Avishtaya Apo Bhavantu Pita Shanyo Avishtaya Om Bhavantu Om Prana Om Chakshu Chakshu Om Shrutyam Shrutyam Om Nabhi Om Hidayam Om Kanta Om Om with four phases and reciting these mantras in silence, deep breathe out. Hold the breath out and you may recite first three of them. Deep breathe in. Hold the breath within, and you may recite. Om Om Now the second time, deep breathe out. Hold the breath out. Deep breathe in. To hold it within. The third and final deep breath out. Hold it out. Deep breath in. Hold it within. Oh, Om Vitanja Satyanja Vidha Tapas, oh, dear, oh, you too. 
भवत के प्यानी मुझको उपासनाधिकम धर्मांत काम मोक्षाण सिद्ध सिद्धि भवे ओम नम शंभवाय मयो भवाय नम शिवाय शिवतराय शांति शांति दैट कंक्लूड्स वॉट इज नोन एज वैदिक संध्या संध्या वंदनम एज डन एज संध्योपासन वी कैन डिवोट नेक्स्ट फ्यू मिनट्स टू question answers Acharya ji, kisi so no one is asking. Can I just ask one question? Yeah, sir. Sure. Yeah, it's about. Uh, I'll not take much time. It's about the twenty-eighth sutra of first chapter, and I just want to know. I mean, I was going through Vyash Bhas and Bhojvritti, and they say that साढ़े तीन मात्रा वाले प्रणव का जप एंड उसके वाच ईश्वर के स्वरूप का ध्यान सो इवन भाष व्यास से ईश्वर का स्वरूप भोज वृत्ति आल्सो से ईश्वर का स्वरूप का ध्यान सो आई अंडरस्टैंड यू हैव टॉट अस दैट प्रणव इज द इज द नेम ऑफ द गॉड एंड इट हैज नो मीनिंग रादर इट हैज अ भाव इट हैज अ फीलिंग बट वॉट डज दिस स्वरूप मीन्स हेयर what is it indicating that do we keep the way om is written also in the mind or what is it indicating when it says swarup you know everything has its what is called its swarup and uh, then there are certain add ons you know swarup is very intrinsic inherent aspect of that thing so when we say ishwar is just say nyay ka ji now this is his function when the universe exists he is managing us all the purush from one life form to another and uh, sustenance of some sort of a law and order now this feature of his being just is not there when the universe is not there for example so he is just that is not by swaroop that is his one of his characteristics so swarup is something is a characteristic that is inherent to him that is always with him so his anand swarup is always with him is aspective of whatever else is happening or in the universe so swarup is you know like our swarup is consciousness chaitanya even i am sleep the body may not exhibit consciousness 
but the purush is always conscious so that entity what we call as purush its swarup is chaitanya now ishwa swarup is chaitanya plus ananda ananda is something that there is no deficiency in his being no no we are chaitanya but we are not fulfilled you know we have something missing in us that way we lack anand you know and unless i get that touch so even when i am with him i get a taste of anand but i don't become anand swarup you know he is always anand swarup that just like i am always chaitanya swarup so swarup is a intrinsic entity in our end characteristic of an entity so this swarup means is anand swarup only there is nothing else is not Actually, about his he is, group he is he is ishwar is sachidanand swarup yeah, yeah so he is always an existent by way in nature of his being he is always in consciousness but this is true with us also besides satan chit he is anand swarup which we are not So, swarup has nothing to do with roop, you know. Roop, yeah, that is what I was just confused that yeah, when. No, uh, you shouldn't get confused. Yeah, Here bhoj vritti. Here the emphasis vritti. is on swa. Yeah, bhoj bhoj vritti says sare teen matra, three and a half matra. So I thought maybe he's indicating about the way it is written as well. So, but it's only the anand swarup, which yeah. is the his key characteristic. Thank you, Acharya. Yeah. Any other question or comment? Yes, comment is there. Oh, maybe maybe I forgot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there. Thank yeah. you, Swami. Yeah. Because much this much. is conclusion of the course, so you yeah. know, I had a slide even after this upasna practice. Yes. Yeah, there was a slide. Okay. So just you know, what next? So the present course will be he offered from ninth July again at the same hour. So every Saturday, like we do nowadays, eleven thirty to one, we have sixty minutes for the ideas, etc., including practice, and then later thirty minutes for question and answer. So we'll follow the same here. i am thinking of this i cannot say i have decided but i am thinking in terms of a new course on sankhya likely to begin from middle of september and i have chosen an hour again these are eastern time new york atlanta and toronto are here eastern zone what we say that will be sunday 9 to 10 so that will be 60 minutes i don't think i will include practice there so 40 45 minutes on discussion so sang has total 600 sutras so my estimate is if we cover 10 in one session this will go about 60 sessions for about a year so that's quite a lot of commitment so i have to you know think more about it but i am thinking in this direction so i can say formally thank you to all for joining me for this course thank you to you acharya ji and acharya ji any time any time frame on your three books that you had planned yes, and how yes, would we know how would we know that yeah sankhya the sankhya commentary i am writing in hindi at this stage okay. so mm -hmm. i thought uh, it will be a good idea i can share my ideas 
So from September on we can, that's why I thought about it. Yoga, I have not written anything, but my ideas have crystallized very much. So writing is, a, yeah, I have to do it, but that will be wow. it. Then. So I have told you I am writing three books. Yes. Know, Vedic Cognitive Science, Sankhya and Yoga, in this order. So first in Hindi, then in English, because English, my English is not that good. You know, and secondly, I still have need some, you know, there are so many terms I have to, that's a quite a challenge, you know, like Chitta, Vritti, what should be the right English terms? So, of course, I have to look at what, like Professor Woods, he's a, what kind of terms they have used and why they have used. You have to look at it all this. It will take me some time. So writing part Hindi is easier for me. So I have taken it that way. So as it is, I am writing commentary on Sankhya in Hindi now. Okay. And of course, the starting point was Ankar. But as I am writing, I will tell you, there are 30 or 40 occasions where the modern commentators have missed the, not just Vankar, they have missed many, many points. Very sad. Okay. You know, Binaji has also already said thank you. It's been a, you know, everyone here, I'm sure wants to say thank you. For your, for your time and your we wisdom. Saying thank you is not, you know, because we cannot yeah. express what we get. I've been attending your classes regularly and every time there is something new to learn. Everything, whatever you say. I had to go out because it's a, all of a sudden very big storm came and emergency situation has been alert. I can't even believe what's happening outside. <clears throat> so thank you, Acharyaji. I'm looking very forward good. to next courses. And I'll go through your slides again and again and again whenever I have time. I just take a little bit click and I try to absorb things, you know. Well, uh, Jarji, there are... We all are very fortunate to get this guidance from you. And um, our gratitude to you. And we are always there in your team. And anything we can do for you... Is you have to bring youngsters, you know. I mean, it's such a great knowledge. And what I feel, Acharyaji, the way you told us about Ishwar Swarup, like it's nobody explains you that so beautifully. We say Nirankar, hai, Nirakar, hai, Nirvair, hai, sab aisa bolte hai. but like how to understand that in deep, you know? Ki we are also part of that, and like we are in Chaitanya and he is in Ananda. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. In my words, in my words, Acharyaji, I was thanking you today morning after my upasana and I said lucky are those people who get a guru who tells them who is Ishwar and also tells them how to reach him. Exactly. So I think this set of people has got everything that one can dream of in this earth. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. All. I thank him every time whenever I have that kind of uh, like 24 hour I think that we are always in mother's lap that, that's such an easy way to just get away from all of these situations where you are facing it because you are not that, you know, like you are a special person, special soul here, unique person here, you know, like in a form, but you are all have some. So that's why I'm so thankful to you. I sh Actually, I should write and send it to you, whatever I have to say. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm really grateful to you. Tons of gratitude and appreciation for whatever you do for us, for our soul, for our real soul, actually. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. session was very interesting. And I'll be listening to your other sessions as I go on. And uh, really, after the reciting of the Sandhya, I really felt felt deep inside the meditation. I was totally, totally absorbed. And I didn't know where it was hard to come back out of it. So I really feel as everybody else to be blessed 
to be your student and we look forward to that and I would look forward to your uh, books as well. I like to get a copy of the books. So you let me know how I can get them and then I try my best to get them. Ajay, do you write in Hindi or English? Yeah, I wrote a book on Sandhya in Hindi. Okay. Yeah, if I will no, write a comprehensive right. email. A number of people have asked, but somehow I have not been no, able to. No, but the do book it. you're writing and now on Samachar. How the books are available, etc. So okay. You will get an email, but I cannot promise how many <laughs> days or weeks, <laughs> but I will send an email. Acharya yeah. ji, your English is really very good, actually. You are a very humble person. Very yeah. humble. The grammar, yeah. grammatically, also, it's so correct all the time. Acharya ji, the books you're writing now, will they be in English or Hindi? Both. The book I am writing now is in Hindi on Sankhya. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, again, thank you all. And thank we'll you to you, Acharya ji. Continue to meet again on one forum. Thank you. Thank you. We'll miss you. <laughs>